Well, I'm sure all of you have been riveted by the events in Tunisia and Egypt and beyond. And uh, so be it. What an amazing time in human history. Among other things, there's a revolution in revolutions. Up until three weeks ago, all revolutions throughout history had leaders. There was uh, maybe a great leader like George Washington or Mao Zedong or Che Guevara or, you know, Ayatollah Khomeini. And there was some kind of vanguard organization that was mobilizing the people. Sometimes the masses got ahead of their leaders, but there was always a structure there. And whether it was making placards, uh, organizing the logistics on demonstrations, arming the people, managing the military conquest of power, there were hierarchical leaderships. Tunisia points to a new kind of revolution, a wiki revolution, where because of social media, the transaction and collaboration costs of dissent have dropped dramatically. It's occurred in business, too. The internet and social media have changed the deep structure and architecture of corporations by lowering transaction and collaboration costs. But they've also changed the capability of people to collaborate to do extraordinary things, like bring about the defeat of an old oppressive government. Now, while all of this is enormously positive, um, there's a historic challenge that's taking place. You see, when the old regime falls, because a mass collaboration has created this change, there's no structure, there's no organization, there's no party, there's no institution prepared to take over the reins of government. And we do need organizations, notwithstanding this age of mass collaboration. So, it poses some very interesting challenges and very interesting questions for all of us. How do we achieve a new age, a new time of openness and of democracy, of economic development, and of social justice? And that's what I'd like to speak to you about today. Welcome to the age of macroeconomics. Now, if you look around at many of our institutions today, like our old models of government, or like old models of global cooperation where the United States supported oppressive regimes like Egypt because it was a bulwark against Arab nationalism in the Mideast, and it was a way of maintaining stable relationships, many institutions throughout our society are now stalled. They're in atrophy. They're in various stages of failure. Arguably, this is not just some kind of hugely radical period we're going through, and it's certainly not the aftermath of some kind of economic meltdown only. I think this is a turning point in human history. Arguably, the industrial age and its institutions have run out of gas. And whether it's the old industrial age corp corporation epitomized by General Motors, America's greatest company, it went bankrupt, or financial services industry that because it had a whole modus operandi that lacked integrity and openness and collaboration, collapsed and brought down the global economy, or perhaps newspapers that are disappearing. Seventy newspapers in the United States have gone bankrupt in the last decade. We could go through all of these institutions. All of them are stalled. But at the same time, and that's what you're talking about at this conference, all of them are being rebuilt around a new open and networked model. Now, I think if you want to understand what's happening today, you don't go back to you know, the recession of 91 or 81 or even the Great Depression. You need to go back earlier in human history. Several hundred years ago, all around the world, we had agrarian economies. And people had no knowledge. The m means of production was called feudalism, and knowledge was concentrated in tiny oligopolies. 
But when Johannes Gutenberg came up with this great invention, people started to have knowledge. And over time, the institutions of feudal society appeared to them to be stalled, or in atrophy, or frozen, or failing. It didn't make sense for the church to be responsible for medicine. It didn't make sense for a bunch of kings and nobles to be making all the decisions in society. So we saw the rise of parliamentary democracy, a new form of governance. We saw the rise of, of the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther called the printing press God's highest act of grace. Creation of science, the modern university, the industrial revolution, and capitalism, and it was all good. It advanced the standard of living of people around the world, but it came with a cost. Now, once again, the economic and technological genie is out of the bottle. And we have a new revolution in communications, but it's very different. And its potential is infinitely greater because the printing press gave us access to the written word, the web enables each of us to be a publisher. The printing press gave us access to recorded knowledge. The internet gives us access to the knowledge contained in the crania of other people on a global basis, real time. And this is taking us into, I think, nothing less than a new age, an age of networked intelligence. Now, this is not a new idea. I've been writing about this for 30 years. Some of you may have read a book uh, by Alvin Toffler. It's got to be almost 30 years ago. It's called The Third Wave, right? Agrarian, industrial, I forget what he called it, information age or something like that. But you know what? These were ideas in waiting. Their time had not come. They were waiting for some big developments. They were waiting for the new web and the mobile revolution. They were waiting for a new generation of digital natives. I'm a digital immigrant. I had to learn the language. The first generation to grow up digital. This is the biggest generation ever, uh, except in Western Europe and in Japan. But all around the world, there's a demographic tsunami. And this generation is coming into a terrible world. You know, 40% youth unemployment in Spain. Tunisia was 32%. Throughout the Mideast, it's not untypical for there to be 30% youth unemployment, but it's not just the Mideast. France has 25% youth unemployment. The United States has 23% youth unemployment. We told these young people, you work hard, you get a degree, you have good values, you can have a prosperous and good life. We didn't tell them the truth. And I'm convinced that there were in the early days of a youth radicalization. You see, because biggest generation ever, they're coming into an awful workforce, and at their fingertips, they have the most powerful tool ever for finding out what's really going on, informing others, and organizing collective responses. And Tunisia shows what happens when they get really upset. So we have a social revolution that's leading to an economic revolution, some profound changes in the global economy. And we also have, bundle in, the economic crisis. I mean, who would have imagined three years ago that a big theme of business books these days would be, is capitalism savable? And these books are not being written by radicals. They're being written by people like Matthew Bishop from The Economist. He's the business editor of The Economist. So what this crisis is doing, it's having the effect of creating a burning platform in all of our institutions, causing us to rethink them, whether it's the corporation, our models of government, our models of global problem solving. This is a time when we need to reboot business and the world. Now, uh, this is a very short talk that I have today. I don't have a lot of time, but let me just make a couple of points. We can rebuild the world and its institutions around a new set of principles. The principles of collaboration. I'm not talking about a bunch of nice people getting together in a room. I'm talking about collaboration that can now occur on an astronomical scale. If you can create an encyclopedia of a million people they've never met, 
the quality is just as good as Britannica, but it's 10 times bigger and in 190 languages, what else could you create? Could you create a computer operating system? Well, Linux is now the dominant operating system in the world for medium and large computers. It's about to become the dominant operating system on mobile devices. Linux is used in nuclear power plants. Could you create a physical good through mass collaboration and through collaborative innovation? Well, the Chinese motorcycle industry is dozens of little companies. They all work together. They meet in the internet and on tea houses. There's no OEM, there's no Harley Davidson pulling all the strings. This is now one third of all motorcycle production in the world. And get ready for the thousand dollar car from China as well. Theme number two, openness. Everyone's all bent out of shape about WikiLeaks and for sure there are some difficult issues there. But the main message that every business and government leader should be understanding is that this is an age of hyper-transparency you're going to be naked as a company or as a government. And if you're going to be naked, fitness is no longer optional, okay? Or if you're going to be naked, you better be buff, meaning you better have good value, because value is evidence like never before. You, have, you say you have good products, they better be good. But you need to have values. You, you need to have integrity as part of your bones. Sharing intellectual property. This is not about being socialist or something like that. Nike recently and a number of other companies launched the Green Exchange where they're placing their intellectual property into a commons. And they're doing it for not just that a rising tide lifts all boats, but for solid business reasons. The old model is, no, our IP belongs to us. Someone tries to infringe it. We'll get out our lawyers. Um, and we'll, we'll take legal action. Well, that didn't work so well for the record industry, did it? The industry that brought us Elvis and the Beatles is suing children. It's hated by its customers. It's collapsing, and you'll read in Macroeconomics, the number three source of the U.S. record labels is suing people that love music. Interdependence. If there's anything this crisis tells us, it's that business can't succeed in a world that's failing. And we need to have integrity, honesty, consideration, accountability, transparency baked into our bones. Imagine if we rebuilt our institutions around a new communications medium and around these five principles, what could happen? Now, just a, a little story about the power of this mass collaboration. Uh, I understood its application to the political sphere about four years ago when someone sent me a note saying, do you know this guy, Obama, he's trying to get the Democratic nomination? He thinks your book, Wikonomics, is the key to winning the presidency and transforming America. Go to mybrackobama.com. So I went there, and there was my book. It says, we believe in the principles of transparency, inclusiveness, using the internet. We believe in the book, Wikonomics, by Don Tapscott. And I'm asking you to believe not just in in my ability to bring our real change in Washington. I'm asking you to believe in yours. And, and I looked at this thing. Well, my first reaction was, I am the man. <laughs> but not so fast, because I got in there a little farther, and I saw that there was also a young firefighters for Obama community and a single moms who support daycare for Obama community. He created a platform whereby 35,000 communities self-organized. That's what brought him to power. He changed the way you get elected, but did he change the way you rule? Arguably, we still have the you vote, I govern one-way model of democracy. It's not good enough for a networked age, and it's sure not good enough for a new generation that's grown up interacting and want to collaborate. So just a couple of words on four of these institutions. Each of these blocks is sort of like a very long uh, discussion and, and presentation, but I'll just give you a little flavor. Industrial Age Corporation, right? Typified by General Motors. Well, it went bankrupt. There's a new kind of auto company emerging. Local Motors. An Iraq vet saw his friends be killed in Iraq. He decided that we're in Iraq to defend America's energy sources and a sclerotic auto industry that's been unable to build uh, safe, sustainable, energy efficient cars that actually correspond to people's needs. So he's building a new kind of car company called Local Motors. 
He has 5,000 designers on the internet. No $3 million square foot manufacturing facility. He's got 30 local facilities and 30 geographies in the United States producing local cars for local marketplaces. The financial system. The subprime mortgage crisis, I lend you some money, I know that you can't make the payment, uh, but then I bundle up a bunch of loans into a collateralized debt obligation, I get an insurance company, uh, well, by, I get a rating agency that I pay to rate at AAA, I get it insured by an insurance company, I sell it to a whole bunch of investors. And if the whole thing goes bad, I'm insured if it goes down. This is called a violation of all of these principles. It's sure not being considerate. I mean, the homeowners lost their homes, the rating agencies almost went under, the insurance companies did go bankrupt, the investors lost all their money, and as a result today, we have 40% youth unemployment in Spain. We need a new model, a new modus operandi for the financial services industry. And arguably there is one. I don't have time to tell you about it. But uh, the newspapers, the old model, well, Chicago Sun-Times and 70 other newspapers went bankrupt. What is the new model? Is it the Huffington Post? I'm not sure, you see, because the Huffington Post is 20 times bigger than the New York Times. It's a profitable organization, but journalists don't get paid. We have some complicated issues to address. How do we ensure quality, investigative journalism? How do we prevent ourselves from balkanization where we're all following only the news sources we believe in and we end up in these little self-reinforcing echo chambers where the information is not to inform us, it's to, to give us comfort. Well, there are new models that are emerging that address these issues. This is an exciting and it's a wonderful time. Let me end with this whole issue of global problem solving because we have global um, problem solving based on nation states. And they're not working. All these institutions that came after the Second World War, the, uh, the United Nations, the GATT, the IMF, the WTO, uh, the World Bank. So all these nations, the G20 and then the G8, and they say the G2. I think we're down to the G0 at this point. They all go off to Copenhagen to try and solve the problem of climate, cha uh, climate change or to Cancun. They can't get a deal. Meanwhile, there are... 20 million people on planet Earth just self-organizing to solve this problem. They're not just talking about it, they're doing things. They're architects, retrofitting old buildings and kids in schoolyards, reducing carbon in their school district. This is the first time in human history where the world is being mobilized and we're all on the same side. We've been mobilized around world wars, but we were on different sides. What an exciting time to be alive. And whether it's Ushahidi solving problems in Kenya, after the elections, or finding kids in the rubble in Haiti, or whether it's Kiva and micro-lending addressing the big problems of poverty in the developing world, or even the World Economic Forum. I just came back from Davos, I see some of you who are there, who's trying to build a multi-stakeholder network to address some real issues. This is a time of very profound change. It's a time when people can communicate at the speed of light through networks of glass and air to address the big problems that face us in the world and where power is shifting away from our traditional industrial age institutions to the vernacular. This is a time of very profound change and it's a time of revolution and I don't use that word lightly. So let me end with a thought if I could. We're at a turning point, I think, and I'm so excited to be at Lyft and, and for this conference to be happening right now at this particular point in human history. Anthony Williams and I tried to look at natural analogies to understand what a new aid of network intelligence might look like. And we came across this thing called the murmuration. In the moors of uh, England, in the winter uh, nights, the starlings, who've been out over a 20-mile radius, come together at night, and they create one of the most spectacular things in nature. It's called a murmuration, and it's in reference to the murmuring of the wings of the birds. And the murmuration is not just for show. 
it warms the birds up for the cold night ahead, and it protects the birds. You can see in this video here a hawk that's being singly, singularly uh, ineffective at getting at the birds. There's a social exchange that takes place, and there's no one leader for the murmuration, like there was no one leader in Tunisia. But there's the Tunisian government, a hawk on the right there, being chased away. Scientists that have studied this thing say that they're, they've never seen a, an accident, actually. And it made, made us wonder about, as we connect ourselves increasingly and open up the bandwidth of, human, of humanity, could this lead to something quite profound? Well, I think we're seeing this play out. You know what? The Tunisia demonstrators and the Tunisia revolution and now in Egypt and soon in Yemen and across the Mideast and who knows where, sort of look like this. There, it's a collaboration. It's based on openness and information exchange. And you don't shut down the internet because then people come into the streets. It's based on sharing of knowledge and, and ideas. And there's an interdependence, understanding that the interests of the individual is consistent with the interests of the whole. The murmuration has a great integrity, as do these new mass collaborations, that gives the birds great courage, in a sense, to take on a fearsome predator. Well, what if we could hook up our brains together? What could we achieve? Could we not only share information and knowledge, but, I don't know, could we create some kind of collective intelligence? Could we create some kind of consciousness that extends beyond an individual? If that were possible, then this age of networked intelligence could be an age of promise fulfilled and perhaps of peril unrequited. Because, say, learning organizations have been hard to achieve. Maybe organizations like people that are not conscious cannot learn. If we could create some kind of consciousness within an organization, within a community, within a nation or society, then perhaps we could address these huge, difficult challenges facing our world and facing this next generation because they know that they're inheriting a world that is deeply broken and that needs to be rebuilt. French pilot from the Second World War, his name was uh, Saint-Exupéry. He says, uh, he was a philosopher too. He said, we should welcome the future for soon it will be the past, but we should respect the past for it was once all that was humanly possible. Is it possible that we could go forward and build something extraordinarily new? I don't know. One thing for sure, is the next period will not be boring. Thank you very much.